Hello and welcome to A Blind Date with Knowledge, the podcast shining a spotlight on research in the Northeast. I'm your host, Stephen Liggett, and thankfully, is the return of Laura Brady. Hello, hello. <laughs> it's good to be back. So today, we're just around the corner from my office on Claremont Road. We're within the Newcastle University campus. Um, we're actually in the in part of the medical school. Mm-hmm. Um, posh. But it is a bit confusing here how there's about three buildings in, in one building. Yeah. Um, so I think we're between the William Leach and another one. Yeah. But um, I mean, the, the most important thing is that we, we're here and we found where we are. <laughs> and if we get lost, this can be our final contribution to the world of research. <laughs> yeah. So we've come to this beautiful building to yes. have a discussion with someone who we spoke to briefly in the Med Tech Day Out episode called Dr. Rachel Dickinson, the Communication and Engagement Manager for the MIC. Stephen, anything to add? Oh, sorry, that was so. Threw under the bus there, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would absolutely say go check out the Med Tech Conference. There's a real short introduction to Rachel's work in that episode. We hope Rachel will expand on a role, hear a bit more about the work of her and her team. And we're hoping that she can share some exciting developments about the MIC and its role in the future. Yeah, exciting. Should we get to it? Let's get to it. Oh, God. Hi, so I'm here today with Dr. Rachel Dickinson. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for being here with us. So would you like to give us a bit of a background of how you found yourself where you are now, specifically in Newcastle, at what we currently call the MIC? Yeah, so I'm a communications and engagement manager at the, the Newcastle MIC, Newcastle In Vitro Diagnostics Cooperative. So yeah, my, my role at The MIC is sort of focused around kind of managing and developing content for our website and social media. And we have a newsletter as well that we circulate. Mm -hmm. Um, And then another key element of the work is we produce these added value examples, which is like highlighting. uh, So it's a kind of summary that highlights impact associated or potential impact that might be associated with, with projects. And we do this for our annual report for the NIHR. So they fund us. So that's the National Institute for Health and Care Research. And um, we can use these to kind of show the NIHR that they've, you know, we're using their funding wisely. And they use it to show evidence to the Department of Health and Social Care that fund them um, to, to show that, you know, it's worthwhile funding this scheme because it's having benefits to patients, to life science companies, Mm -hmm. um, to the economy, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I suppose I've found myself in this role through having an interest basically for a long, for a long time in kind of science communication, Mm -hmm. um, and also genetics and molecular biology. So that's my, my background. So I spent five years doing an undergraduate degree at Glasgow University um, in genetics. And that involved a year working in Iowa in the United oh, States. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so I worked on like a company that produces genetically modified corn. Okay. Oh, wow. So that was quite interesting. Wow, yeah. Um, and it was my first sort of taste of working in a lab. So I really enjoyed that year and um, and seeing actually that kind of company perspective yeah. as well was quite interesting. And uh, I think it was through that that then I decided I'd like to do more research. So I did a PhD. Um, well, but, genetic research. Yeah. Um, so you hadn't really had, you sort of made the move to sort of medical genetics or is that, yeah. when did that happen for you? I think that was probably, yeah, during my final year. So the the year in industry was between my third and fourth year. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and I did my final year. And that's really when we could pick more specific modules that we wanted to do. And I really found an interest in kind of medical genetics and the kind of molecular genetics. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and that's when I thought actually I'm yeah I'm quite fascinated around you know what genes might be associated with mm-hmm. different medical conditions mm-hmm. and um, and then uh, I saw this PhD advertised at Birmingham University that was around breast cancer and tumor suppressor genes that mm-hmm. are inactivated in different types of cancer including breast cancer so that was the PhD that I did that PhD was um, the PhD was funded by the breast cancer campaign so I really enjoyed the opportunities to go and meet the kind of fundraisers and patients um, but also it kind of because of the way the research developed I ended up kind of also exploring the role of these genes in other types of cancer. Yeah. So I kind of got an interest also in ovarian cancer. And then there was a project, a postdoctoral research project at Edinburgh. So I, I moved there and continued my research there. And it was quite nice because it was also working closely with a unit that was funded by the Medical Research Council. So that was quite interesting to work at the university, but also with this MRC unit as well. And then around 13 years ago now, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I moved Time to flies. Newcastle <laughs> yeah. in 2010, and there was an opportunity to work uh, around kind of genetics of leukemia and hereditary immunodeficiency conditions. So where uh, yeah, families have, they, there's this kind of inherited um, um, immune deficiency. Um, and yeah, I found that work really interesting, particularly because it was, I suppose the project in Edinburgh was more um, kind of looking at, I, I developed lots of different skills around kind of, growing cells and doing kind of microscopy and things but the project in Newcastle it was more like back to the kind of genetics right. and doing this sort of lots of analysis of sequencing mm-hmm. and this next generation sequencing that was like a new emerging yeah, technique yeah. at the time so what, what so, was that like to be part of that and how, how what changes have you noticed then since you know beginning to work with the um, next generation sequencing and, and now like what do you see like a big difference in yeah I think it is interesting how over this few years that yeah, the kind of technology has really kind of made a lot of advances. And I suppose now the challenges may be around the analysis sometimes of okay. the data. And you, yeah, I think you need to now have a lot of computational, yeah. um, you know, skills mm-hmm. or, or hire people that have that ability to kind of analyze big data sets. But yeah, I think alongside the kind of lab side of things and being in the lab doing all the research I always enjoyed the kind of communication side of things as well Mm -hmm. so that's what really attracted me to this particular role at the MIC because yeah when I was in Edinburgh I volunteered at some science festivals and then in Newcastle I kind of did the same and actually designed an activity that i uh, with a couple of other um, people in the lab Mm -hmm. and um, that was really good and I also edited for us did some editing for a science magazine um, and also um, worked with artists to produce um, a strip for a Newcastle science comic Mm -hmm. so yeah so I really enjoyed that sort of side of things and and being able to share research to different audiences and actually get that public perspective yeah. on the work as well is really important yeah. so totally um is is there something to do around genetics because i think to the general public it's this new scary science so you've spoke there about a lot of different ways to to communicate this new technology how easy do you think it is to get your message across in this there's you know we live in an age of there's all this information and social media like how how easy 
Yeah, is it to break this down for people, do you think? Yeah, I think it can be quite challenging. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I think, but yeah, I think it's it's really important to be able to explain things in a in a kind of non-expert way yeah, to help bridge that gap maybe and um yeah I, I mean I'm always well I suppose also an appreciation that people like to consume information in different ways so yeah. I mean, often yeah. so another aspect of the work that I should mention in my current role is we have a, a panel of public contributors that we work very closely with and um, one of the early parts of my role was um, developing a new website. Well, I didn't develop it myself, but <laughs> I kind of developed content for the website yeah. with a website yeah. developer. But the, the, our panel of public contributors were really fundamental in helping us get some of these the messages across from our work with like some nice kind of graphics mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. kind of explain things. Um, and then also we have like a kind of a jargon buster section of the website with like A to Z of like different terms that we use. Um, because I think even though sometimes, you know, you feel that you're explaining things in a plain English way, I think the longer you work in a particular area, the more like things yeah. start to just, yeah, kind yeah. of sneak in to <laughs> and then you start to assume that everybody knows you know certain words that you're using so it's yeah it's really good to have that sense check from the public yeah. panel and they've really helped us to think about the the benefits of what we're doing and yeah. and kind of making sure that we're sharing that yeah it's it's really important i think it's something that we could you know continue to improve on in terms of research and the, the whole communication and engagement side but especially the sort of descriptions and the, the jargon and the and acronyms that we use so what what do you think would be your tip your top tips to somebody who was you know try, trying to communicate and engage the public in with their research like and, and what do you think is important to sort of welcome um constructive feedback Oh, that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah, so I, I would say to to try and and find some public group groups to to speak to at an early stage for sure. I've, I think one of the things I've learned from working with the public panel is to not make any assumption, mm. you know, and and really recognise that when you're speaking to just a small public panel, they're just this small group of people and yeah. and things. But I think to get yeah, to get a perspective of the of someone that's outside of the of your research is really useful. And yeah, don't assume that oh people will won't understand something or will understand something. Um so to really yeah, I think to co co develop things with a public yeah. panel is really useful. And we we try and, and do that with kind of all aspects of our work really. Yeah. And like um, you said, it's that sort of from an early stage in the process as well. Yeah. That, that's where you're going to get a lot of use out of that. And I think it's becoming more and more almost obligatory now. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say you have a lot more experience of genetic research than me, Laura, but I, I know there was a, a study I was involved in, well, it was a long time ago now, called the 100,000 Genome project and it was interesting we went to a results day and there was a discussion around how the people who took part wanted to then know ab about the results because there was a assumption i think that everyone would like to get the results know all about it but if if, if there isn't there wasn't a treatment for mm. the majority of the things that came up so there's this whole like ethical debate isn't there around how much information you give people if, if there isn't a treatment or a solution available but it absolutely ties into what you've just explained there if if, if, if there's early engagement you, you kind of know how to process and sh share yeah. the information after a trial and then like that that study you mentioned, I know there was some sub studies after that that started to look at that and mm -hmm. see the effect of sort of whether people it was 
um, of benefit to people to to know this to know their results not, you know, are different. Yeah. And again, like you said, it's just a small group, so it's for some people it might be one thing, and for some of the others. And I think we're getting to that point of personalizing mm-hmm. it a little bit, and mm. like, I, I guess it kind of has to be a little bit more with genetics. It's already naturally personalized. So how does setup of the MIC, would, would it be in a cooperative? Um, yeah. How does this sort of aid you to do the work that, 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 that you do here? The work of the MIC, so I'll start a bit from the, the beginning. Um, we were basically a group of researchers that are really focused around methods and the methods that are used to, to help um, evaluate new diagnostic tests. So we call the team methodologists. So they're involved. They use a variety of different methods to gather, analyze, interpret data. Okay. Diagnostic um, data. Yeah. Data. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. So it's sort of we work very closely with the developers of new diagnostic tests. Mm-hmm. So they might be university researchers. They might be companies of different sizes. So we work sometimes with multinational companies, um, but also uh, primarily with um, small, medium-sized enterprises um, and spin-outs from universities. So there's a big Um, range of people then. mm, Yeah, and basically what we're doing is we're helping them to generate a, a portfolio of evidence so that then their diagnostics will be suitable for use on patients and in the best place to be adopted and and purchased by the healthcare systems. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we will work on commercially funded projects. So big companies will sometimes come with their own funding or other times we work on funding applications with smaller companies mm-hmm. um, and we can support them. We're a partnership between Newcastle University and Newcastle Hospitals. Okay. Um, so we work a lot with also other groups within the U- Newcastle University and Newcastle Hospitals, and we're part of this kind of network called the Diagnos- Diagnostics Northeast um, that can kind of support the developers of new diagnostics at different stages. So sometimes there may be groups that are involved in lab side of things. So we work very closely with. Um, the Northeast Innovation Lab at Newcastle Hospital. So they do a lot of looking at the performance of new diagnostic tests Mm -hmm. and they have this big biobank of samples. So that's really useful. Um, Whereas our expertise in the MIC, as I say, is more around this sort of like helping with the design and the methodology and the analysis. Mm -hmm. So we do sort of three, we have sort of three main areas um, one that's around care pathway and what we call care pathway analysis, mapping out this sequence of interactions that a patient experiences as they move through the healthcare system with a suspected medical condition. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is to pinpoint, so it ends up being a kind of flow chart. Mm-hmm. And then it's helping to pinpoint where a new diagnostic solution might then be introduced mm-hmm. to help with the management of. Or so the like diagnosis of a condition. The right time point for that. Um, yeah. And see where it kind of best fits. So yeah. what sort of factors do you look at to identify that point? Then what, what do you consider when you're um, doing that care pathway analysis? Yeah, so it's sort of, it involves looking at local and clinical guidelines mm-hmm. and then also looking in the literature and and then we do a lot of, um, so this is also back to the kind of collaboration because we're always yeah kind of yeah. collaborating and 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 speaking to people so we'll speak to sometimes to patients um to healthcare staff clinicians um commissioners and find yeah get get their views mm-hmm. on what is the current process and how might a new diagnostic fit in and what what would be the best characteristics of that new diagnostic? Mm. So not only sort of what, where it is, but how does it? How is it? And yeah, what, exactly. What does it look like? How is it yeah. 
experienced this, by the patient. And 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 if yeah, because sometimes um, depending on where there might be a need for it, you need to think about well, who would actually be using the test, mm -hmm. and is is a test as it is going to be easy to be used by a you know if it's oh well actually it would be handy to have a test that's used rather than in a hospital laboratory it's used close to the patient yeah. and a nurse is going to, to to do this test then you have to make sure that the test is like suitable to be used by it you know what yeah, I mean like exactly. it's, and and what kind of sample would be taken mm. and then and this all kind of feeds into then the design of the test so the then the, the companies or the researcher can think when they're developing their test how might we design this also kind of it fits into like clinical studies to look at the accuracy of the test that there you know it feeds into the design yeah. of that study to make sure as you say that it that's being being assessed yeah. in the most appropriate clinical scenario mm -hmm. Um, on the most appropriate kind of samples yeah, and that side of things. Mm -hmm. how, how easy do you find it to facilitate all of these engagements? Because I think there's been a lot of discussions on previous episodes about the barriers to collaboration. So the amount of in, in involvement and relationships that you were uh, trying to manage is absolutely tremendous, but how easy is it to find the the time and space to do the engagement? I think, yeah, I think we appreciate that that's just sort of part of the work, and we do, yeah, we we do some sort. Sometimes it's sort of focus groups, and then yeah. other times it's like one on one interviews that we do as well. Okay. So, as I say, we also have our kind of pub panel of public contributors so we meet with them every sort of two or three months and they will help us design our work as well and then we do have like larger focus groups with with patients and sometimes we'll have a a, a group with uh, we'll have focus groups with clinicians as well but often it's um one-on-one -on -one interviews as well that we do and then we we find that that's a good way of of kind of gathering lots of different people's views. Um, we have a couple of projects at the moment where, uh, so this is actually a project where it's looking at potential for use of diagnostic tests in care homes okay. and where, like what are the challenges in care homes and where could new diagnostic tools be used? Mm -hmm. And there's through interviews with like different care homes, because this is it, you kind of need to also look at the, the bigger oh, yeah. like national Get picture into, um or yeah different yeah so it's in, yeah. yeah it's not enough to well it's useful to go and speak to one you know one group of people but you kind of want to get those different views and find as out what's areas. happening in different Absolutely. areas if you're wanting things to get rolled out and used mm -hmm. across you know the country so yeah through interviews we found like a list of I think thirty potential areas where new diagnostic oh, wow. te tests could be used. Wow, yeah. So then we're using surveys as a way of then prioritize the unmet needs and then come to some kind of consensus. But it is like yes, it's quite a challenge to to kind of uh, as you say when you're getting all these views to then kind of like well okay well yeah. when. What do we do next? But it's, it um, sounds like from what you, you've said, it sounds to be really embedded and it's just it's like yeah. accepted as part of the work. So I guess yeah. it's, we, we talk and talk to some people that it, it is like a bit of an upward struggle or well, they're yeah, trying to get, sort of change a bit of a struggle the culture to, get engaged to do that. Things, yeah. Yeah. So it's lovely to hear that it is sort of just na naturally yeah, a part of that. Nice. Obviously, it takes a bit yeah. of effort, it takes a bit of work. But yeah. when, when the goal is clear, then it... It yeah. seems easier that everybody's got that united um, end point what that you're working towards. So I guess that yeah. helps a bit. Um, ensuring that you've got the collaborative design from conception mm -hmm. all the way through. Yeah, I think that's it. And um, yeah, I think the idea is that then we'll be able to then see whether there's any diagnostic tools already on the market that mm -hmm. might help to address some of these needs. Or it would also um, help the, the 
the diagnostic test developers and the researchers to focus their research in particular areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's, yeah, again, it's sort of helping lots of different people, really. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, and we're kind of helping to facilitate all of that. And the fact that we, that the researchers, the methodologists have all these different skills yeah. means that, yeah, we can do so we can do different have different approaches so as I say f sometimes it's focus groups sometimes it's interviews also doing a lot of kind of systematic reviews right, yeah. um, a lot of systematic like review I think <laughs> we need like more of them review, in the yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. to hear it. You did full training courses for literally no reason. I'm allowed them. Not for no reason. I was about to say that. Sorry, that was a bit, a bit rude, didn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I sometimes wonder why we don't sort of see that more no, happening. I, agree. In, I do agree. Um, the, the starting point of research, you yeah. know, in different spheres. Um, well, I know it's time and money, but at the end of the day, that's uh, well, would be time and money well spent, I think. But I think that's another episode. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that yeah. in New Year. Yeah. Systematically. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously it sounds here like you've got a team like really like diligently working and work together well. Mm. Um so it, it must be something to save sort of for the, the structure and the setup of the MIC, but I hear there's some exciting things on the horizon. So um yeah. would you like to that are you able to tell us a little bit yeah, about that now yeah. and then I guess sort of what that means for the future of the work that you do? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the current funding, um, so we've been kind of working in this area now for around 10 years. Nice. Um, so the MIC has been funded from 2018 um, until uh, 2024. But yeah, prior to 2018, it was had a different name, but we we're doing similar mm -hmm. work um, as a diagnostic evidence cooperative. So we're changing our name for a third time <laughs> um, in April 2024. Yeah, pleased to share that we've been successful in our bid to become a health tech research centre or HRC. Um, again, funded through the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Research, the NIHR. This scheme will enable us to kind of slightly broaden our approach. So at the moment, we're focused on really on evaluating and generating evidence on in vitro diagnostic tests. Mm -hmm. So kind of tests where a sample, clinical sample is taken from a patient. Um, so often they're kind of like, they may be like the lateral flow tests that mm -hmm. people oh, are familiar right, yeah. with from COVID. So those sorts of tests, um, where, whereas as a health tech research center, we'll still be doing, working on those sorts of, or working with diagnostic t test developers who are developing those sorts of tests, mm -hmm. but also imaging technologies and also technologies that might have a digital, yeah, digital technologies, possibly tests that have machine learning, mm -hmm. AI type application. That's the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there will be, there will be some, some challenges there because we'll be having we'll have to kind of upskill a bit to kind yeah. of be able to evaluate some of these sorts of new emerging technologies. I just spoke about the next genome sequencing when he's saying you know once you get have a bit of progress and the, the mm -hmm. analysis then you need to improve the analysis. So I guess you'll have yeah. a similar situation with with technologies yeah. by introducing them. Mm. But yeah, I think there's some other groups within around Newcastle that have got funding recently around digital healthcare as well. So mm -hmm. we'll be working with them. So more collaboration. Yeah, more yeah. even more collaboration. <laughs> yeah, so that will be good. And then I think that the idea as well. So we have at the moment we have three broad kind of clinical themes. So we tend to evaluate tests that fit into one of these three clinical theme themes, and these kind of build on expertise ar around Newcastle really and our expertise within the team and they will be broadly the same but slightly changing so we have um, an aging and multiple long-term conditions theme um, an infection theme and then precision medicine and rare diseases mm -hmm. so the rare diseases bit is will be kind of new and then I think a main area that we're wanting to do is kind of develop our our group of methodologists so when I joined the the MIC team 
there were there was I think maybe two or three members of the team along with myself and over the last sort of five years our teams our core team has sort of grown to about sort of 15 people so it's great to have that core group of of these researchers that are focused on the kind of methods and supporting the the diagnostic evaluation Mm -hmm. process. We talked a bit about the care pathway analysis. The other things we do is around, um, so we do quite a bit of health economic evaluations as well. And then um, we do also, we have statisticians within the team that will um, help with the kind of design and the analysis of measuring the accuracy mm-hmm. of tests. So the kind of clinical clinical studies that measure the kind of diagnostic accuracy mm-hmm. um, of different new tests. Really so they're in just, that like diverse team, then bringing yeah, all the different yeah. teams together. So within the team, we are quite we have quite a variety of different backgrounds I suppose Mm -hmm. so some of us like myself I suppose have a quite kind of traditional kind of academic um, background but other people um, have gone through a kind of the clinical scientist training um, and have backgrounds in kind of and so we have um, people with a background in kind of engineering Mm -hmm. and then yeah there's myself and others that have more of a kind of um kind of genetics molecular biology background we also have people who've more of a kind of social science Mm -hmm. background um also um people who've worked actually in the kind of in healthcare in care homes Mm -hmm. and they have that kind of background so it's good to have all this sort of multi yeah the kind of well, yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a cliche, but the kind of multidisciplinary yeah, kind no, of it's, it's, um, background. It's invaluable um, to bring, bring all those perspectives yeah. together and it rounds off the work that you do. And, and then we do have, um, so we have our kind of core team of like, uh, as I say, I, I think bet- between about 10 and 15 people are methodologists and senior methodologists um, myself and a project manager mm-hmm. and um, we have a patient public involvement and engagement manager and then we do have um, other a kind of senior management team that we meet with um, and they have roles within Newcastle University, Newcastle Hospitals, um, some of these other organisations we've talked about, other NIHR organisations, yeah. the Health Innovation mm-hmm. Network uh have yeah health innovation in northeast north cumbria yeah so yeah and to have all these yeah to be kind of working very closely with all these other organizations in the region mm-hmm. yeah i think we'll be looking to grow that continue to grow that yeah. and then have you know the, 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 the growing expertise as well in different areas that's really it's really exciting so that's april 2024 yeah health tech right. Health research, Tech Research Centre. Health Tech Research Centre. We'll have yeah. to. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll have to come back and see how it's going. Yeah, um, definitely. That will be good. Hit the ground running. And we work very close. So there, there will be one of 14 around right. okay, yeah. England. Yeah, some of them are ones who were also mixed and are changing. And then okay. there's also, I think, four new members of the network oh, will be right, coming yeah. in um so we all have slightly different areas of expertise so yeah. some of the other hrcs are focused in particular on particular medical conditions yeah. whereas we have a kind of broader focus in terms of that but i suppose our areas of expertise is around these sort of our evaluation side and the different methods that we use mm. these conversations are all, all, all always make me feel really proud to be working in the northeast I, I think we show that we do have some superb expertise and facilities and centers and it's kind of how we just promote ourselves a, a bit more because we do you know we do some 
tremendous things up in the northeast and the trajectory of things seem to be you're expanding all the time you're growing you're learning new things you're up, up, up skilling as a team I, I suppose where do you think the direction of travels going in the next 10 years so you know is is, is, is there a vision or like an, an end point um tricky question sorry yeah. what's gonna happen in <laughs> what's the gonna happen in the future <laughs> yes <laughs> I think, well, I suppose one thing we want to do is we, we are, we have our funding through the NIHR, but we are also, as I say, working on sort of external funding as well. And we work closely with a charity called Life Arc as well. So I suppose it would, I think as an, as a group, we're hoping that at some point we'll be able to be on the road to kind of being self-sufficient, mm -hmm. right. I suppose. Yeah. Um, so that's one aspect. And I think we're also looking um, to develop some more training mm -hmm. programs and maybe a kind of possibly a master's mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for for students in this area, because yeah. I think that, I think we, we realize, and I think the, hopefully with the, the NIHR realize having funded us now for mm -hmm. 10 years that this is a really important area yeah. Yeah. um that you know innovation in healthcare has a, lots of benefits and we want that to be available to kind of patients and yeah. the healthcare system as quickly as possible but it's important that these innovations are evaluated in a kind of robust independent way mm. the, the so the more you are with that process it expedites the sort of implementation yeah and use yeah so to kind of for the uk i suppose and for us as you say in the kind of the northeast to be an area that has this expertise in this yeah. um and and just grow that core group that, that mm -hmm. core group of people mm -hmm. um so uh, we we offer at the moment some of the members of the team do deliver lectures um, as part of like existing modules within Newcastle University. And we, yeah, we deliver as a team a, a training course once a year that lots of different people can attend. Often it's diagnostic test developers, but also students and mm -hmm. researchers. Um, and we're, yeah, we're looking to kind of develop that, that more. Mm -hmm. And as I say, potentially like a, a master's that would be something. really exciting with um, seeing more of these types of um, specific courses being created yeah. now, which is great because we need that, you know, people coming in, coming up and wanting to be involved with research, you know, sometimes it takes a long look back round to these sorts of things. So it'd be great to get them. Totally, because the support services in, involved in the delivery, it'll, it'll have to expand to the like the bio in, in, informatics yeah and, these cause new we, yeah, cause, yeah. You know, technologies and, and you're totally right Rachel it's how we bring teams along to be able to deliver and support yeah. genome sequencing or, or these new diagnostic tests yeah yeah, yeah. It's great that's stuff. sort of upskilling yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll work yeah with the new funding we'll be working with the NHIP Newcastle Health Innovation yes. Partners. Who are also changing the name or soon, have. are they? Or have they? Yes, so they're a kind of designated academic health science centre. Uh -huh. So it's sort of the universe, yeah, they're a kind of umbrella organisation with the Newcastle University, Newcastle Hospitals, and another trust, the um, CNTW oh, yes. okay. um, and the city count Newcastle City Council and then also the newly yeah newly renamed so what was formerly the academic health science network for the That's northeast North, North Cumbria who are now their health innovation health innovation northeast North Cumbria yeah. so they have yeah so they have various different areas of activity and one is um, an academy um, for people who are develop early career researchers basically in clinicians, but also other other um, researchers of other types of backgrounds as well. Mm -hmm. And we'll be working with them to deliver some of this training. Oh, amazing. It sounds really exciting. Um, well, I guess it's just to say thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Yeah. Cheers, Rachel, that was fantastic.